Hi, happy Monday, everyone. Here we are for Tech Tip q and I'm going to wait for everyone to get here. And wait for Christina. There she is. Hi, everybody. Happy Monday. Hey, happy Monday, everyone. Let me wave at everybody. All right. So here we are. Welcome back. It is the third Monday of the month. Um, my name is Sarah Walworth. My name is Christina McGrath. We're Knitting Tech Editors. And, and wow. Well, Oh, every Monday we, or every third Monday, we get together live here on Instagram to answer your questions about patterns, knitting, pattern what? writing, knitwear design, tech editing, any of those kinds of things that we deal with in our job. Yes. And we're here because we want to be a help and because... We would like to offer um, our skills and our knowledge to you guys. So if you have a question for us, toss it into the comments below um, and we'll do our best to answer them. We've also uh, received some questions via email and instant message that we'd like to address today too. Some great questions. Um, and if you guys have anything in particular that you want to know about if you're a tech editor or a knitting designer and you've got this burning question that you really want to get an answer for we'll try our best to answer for you what do you think christina are we ready to jump in sure yeah like at any time if you have questions either about what we're talking about based on the questions we already got or just a new question throw it in we'll check them yeah all right, so I printed mine up. <laughs> I did read. too. I, okay, so I guess, I, you know, Christina and I are paper people. <laughs> so I, much paper. We're so pencil, bad. So much paper people. Um, we, we, uh, we, we print stuff up and then uh, work from paper a lot. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, so we had the first question that we got um, was from Karen, and she said she has a question regarding buttons on a deep V cardigan or jacket that's worked bottom up. How high should the band above the top buttonhole and, but and button diameter be? Okay, so it's kind of a design question. And to be honest with you, as a tech editor, I don't know that we have a great answer for this. A V shape um, will cross over me i'm not doing a real great job here it will cross over the the two bands will cross over in order when they're buttoned and that crossover has to happen where you want it to happen in your design and then you would put your buttonholes start slightly below that now what works for one design and one gauge may not work for another so i'm thinking you might have to like swatch it and play around with it what do you think well, what, well so the button band the whole way down is going to be usually the same width right so when right. you get to that v at the top that same width is going to cross mm -hmm. um but if you are then it sounded like she's got a shawl collar situation so if you're yeah. then going to apply a collar that's separate from the button band i would just be sure that the button band allows enough room for that collar to fall open or do whatever it has to do. So there's, there's a few mechanics related to button bands. Number one, that top button is going to get a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. So you may actually want to do a horizontal buttonhole, not a vertical one because a vertical, well, because you want it to, yes, you want a horizontal buttonhole so that the button can move a little bit um, with the stress of it being buttoned there. I don't know, that's just an idea. Um, but you definitely want to make the buttonholes, the width of the buttonholes slightly smaller than the actual width of the buttons so that they stay closed. Otherwise, if the buttonholes are uh, bigger 
than the button, then it's just going to pop open. So, yeah, you need to, I mean, she was asking about the button diameter too. And right. you, um, I don't think you necessarily, I mean, if it's a really heavy collar, maybe you mm -hmm. will need a bigger button than you use on the rest of the sweater. Yeah. But, um, you know, keep your button band, your buttonhole tight and make sure there's enough room up there for the collar to do what it has to do. There needs to be some distance above like where it will cross, but I you the top button if it's worked from the bottom up, you're not gonna it's not like at a here where it's a deep V, so it is gonna land where it's gonna land. You just have to make sure it ends up where you want it to on the body on the in body. whatever size. So I would say swatch. Swatch, 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 swatch. Sometimes swatching is the only solution for these kind of problems. Do you think that answers it? I don't know. You, I'm, feel free to instant message us again and let us know if we, we totally missed your question. Um, yeah, think, we could talk about it more. That was how I interpreted it. Yeah. Was how much space should there be? Yeah. Um, but if that, yeah, but yeah, if that doesn't answer it, please let us know and we'll talk about, talk about Definitely. it more. Definitely. So Creative Me DK, <laughs> Christina, she says, hi from Denmark. One cannot design without paper. Agreed. I need paper a lot. I think I keep our recycling business, our recyclers in business. Um, all right. Are we ready to move to the next question? I think so. Okay. So the next question is when the pattern has the same mistake repeated, in other words, through the whole pattern, should the editor write a note on every single one? So what I do is if there is a error that repeats throughout the whole pattern, and I know what the fix is because um, sometimes you don't. I, if I know what the fix is, I will say, I will highlight it, say, this needs to be X, change throughout. And right. I will highlight all the instances. But I right. will not write what the fix is on every single one. I'll say change throughout the pattern. And I will highlight it throughout the pattern. If, right. it, is something, if it is something that I don't know what the fix is, I will say the same kind of thing. I'll write one note about it and then I will say, but I do that. I'll highlight it throughout the pattern, but I will only note it one time. And in my, in, uh, I think it's important in that note to say this happens in other places too. And I've highlighted them and this is what the issue is so that they don't see those future highlights and like, be like, what's that? Um, I know that, there are some designers I've worked with who really don't want you to highlight it every time because it can add a lot of noise when you have other edits Visual going noise. on. Yeah. yeah. So it adds a lot like more marks, you know, when you've already got other things to alert yourself to when you already know that that mistake is there. I do like to highlight all the instances anyway, though, because we miss them, right? Like if you have a page number wrong or a period missing and it's repeated, something simple like that, you might not see it unless it's highlighted. You might not notice it. So I do like to mark them all, but no, I don't write the note every single time. What do you do? That's a great question. And I get the point of maybe you don't want to mark every single one because it's a time waster. And the, if you know that every single one is an error, then you don't want to add time. Marking, well, marking, that's why marking. I don't write it again and again. Yeah, because I right. don't want to. So that's yeah. exactly what I do is in my annotating software, I'll choose one color highlight for that particular error. Let's say green. It's, you know, all of the stitch counts are formatted incorrectly here. So then I'll highlight it green. And then um, I will put my note in the same color and say, wherever you see green highlight, this needs to be adjusted throughout the pattern. You just um, got a comment who said that. Do you color code it? Yeah, I a color, color code. I color code everything in my patterns. Um, and this, this also can be something else to think about if you're a tech editor. If you notice a consistency issue or a lot of style issues where it's just problem after problem with the same thing and you're going to mark it over and over again, you may want to actually keep two separate copies that are marked differently. So one copy of the pattern is marked with technical errors. So the things that have to be changed, the things that um, have to be corrected number wise or whatever else. And then you might want to do another copy with just style and consistency 
where the designer can make the decision about whether or not they want to fix periods or spaces or whatever else. Um, so there is that two aspects of tech editing where things are definitely wrong and have to be corrected, um, need to be marked. But as far as style, you may be able to do a general note in an email or even a separate copy marking up for the things that are related to formatting and punctuation and stuff like that. Josephine says, uh, I do the same. I color code the issues. Yeah, color code them. Um, so it, it, it makes a lot of sense because that also helps with the visual noise. So if you have a pattern that has a lot of markings and you mark everything with orange highlight and orange type, then your designer may have a hard time seeing what belongs to what, what note goes where. Um, they have so, to interpret every single highlighted mark. Whereas if you say all the green mean this, they, mm -hmm. they, they, don't, they don't have to look at the green one every time because they know what it's for and they don't need to address it. They already looked at it. So I totally, um, I use like my, <laughs> and I have to say that I've learned this from other editors working with other editors. So my colleague, uh, Lisa Beth Houchins, uh, she, her markups look like a rainbow. There's just like colorful and beautiful. I tend to like to stay with one color and then it ends up being a, a visual nightmare for the designer. So I love using multiple colors. Um, just as a shout out to the other tech editors, we really do work with other people and we love to learn from other people's methods. So feel free to ask us what is our method for doing something and there's a bunch of us here right now that can answer questions about how we handle certain marking issues. Uh, annotating a pattern takes time. Um, I have found that I speed it up by using PDF Exchange Editor, which is a software that makes it super simple to annotate. And usually most of the designers can read it in whatever reading software they have in the PDF. Um, working in Word or Pages and doing track changes can take a lot more time. It's a pain. So I prefer to mark up with highlight and typing, annotating directly onto a PDF. And that seems to save a lot of time for my designers so that I'm not overcharging them. That's what I do too. That's what I do too. And I don't, um, I don't color code or change my writing type color or my highlight color unless there's many things. Mm -hmm. Um, because like if, if the color can be used as a tool for me to make the, the reading for them simpler and them checking it simpler, then I do change the color. But, um, I don't like to change color a ton because it's like, it's like an extra step that I have to take yeah. every time I use that typewriter tool or every time I use the highlighter, I have to change the color. Right. So I only use that if I need it for the specific purpose that we described about, you know, and Joe, yeah, PDF Joe is, is Joe great. Is with I use us. it too. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the too. I'm like the evangelist for PDF Exchange Editor. The only downside uh, of it, oh, that's TLC what I see. Stitches says she uses I annotate, and I I did yes. try that, and I will tell you, I had trouble because um, a lot of my edits didn't go through. Like uh, I don't know what the problem was, you know, with what kind of format they were getting the pattern in that I sent, but they didn't see half my edits didn't go through. And then I would email it to myself and half my edits weren't there. So I stopped using that. Also, it wasn't my, I wasn't doing it on like a desktop. Like I was doing it on an iPad and it did not work out for me, but I've, um, that was a long time ago too, like years ago. So hopefully it's improved. Hopefully it's then. improved. So yeah. PDF exchange editor is only on a windows based operating system. So you'll have right. to do some research to find something different if you use, um, a, a, an apple. Well, and does or, I annotate work well for you? Like, do you not yeah. have, do you have, do you not have trouble dying to know? Yes. Yeah. Does it work well? Do you like it? it it didn't with when I first got my iPad look five years ago, then it didn't work real great. But now it does. That's what I mean. Like it was a long time ago that I tried that. Yeah. So TLC stitches, let us know if you think that I annotate works really well. Um, yeah. We'd like to refer our tech editors who use Apple products mm -hmm. to another product that works just as well. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, I think Liz is here so we can pick her brain a little bit more. Uh, Liz, you asked this question. 
Um, I work with a TE, a tech editor who suggests I put special knitting techniques at the end of the pattern instead of before the directions. Is this what you would do? If so, would you position some kind of note before the directions, encouraging the knitter to see the special techniques at the end? Now, it would be great, she says, if every knitter would read through the complete pattern before starting to knit, but that doesn't always happen. That's me. So, thanks. That's a good question. Um, before um, we move on, Sarah, mm -hmm. um, TLC Stitches did answer. She said she flattens the PDF and emails it to herself to check it, and then it works well for her. So oh, that that's is great. Good Okay, good. Thank you good for, uh, for sharing that with us because we'd love to pass on that information to other tech editors who use Apple yeah. products. So I annotate the way to go, flatten it, and send it to yourself to double check. That's all there. <laughs> okay, so Liz, your question is special knitting techniques. Your tech editor is making the suggestion that you put it at the end of the pattern and not before the directions and you're worried that the knitters won't be see it or won't be able to find it or will not pay attention and it's essential to the pattern instructions. What would we do? Christina, you wanna field this one? Well, the first thing I would just remember is that, you know, it's up to you. And also I would ask the tech editor, why do you, why, what is the reason? I'd be curious right now. Like, what is the reason that they think that's a better idea to have it at the end? Um, perhaps it's some sort of thinking like a index, you know, like you have the, the main thing here and then anything you need to refer to regarding it, you would have at the end, like an index. You would look up, oh, I have to look up German short rows. Oh, I have to look up the abbreviations. And I can kind of get that impetus. But um, for me, I like to have the special techniques up front so that it's the same way that I like everything to be up front before the knitter casts on. Also, another big reason to do this is because sometimes the way you do the techniques and the way you explain it in your pattern, if you've gone to the trouble to put it in the pattern and not just send them to a link to a tutorial, you may do it differently. There may be something different about this design that needs it to be done this way. And I think it's really helpful to have those special techniques and any special pattern stitches in the beginning before the directions and instructions start so that the knitter has all that information and they actually, because they don't always read things at the end, you know, and they might not know, they might see, they might see, you know, just to use my example, German short rows, which there maybe aren't other ways to do it, but you know, it's good to, I, anyway, that's what I think. But I would be curious what their um, motivation was, why they think it should be at the end. I would definitely ask why. But yes. I think it should be up front just because it's that kind of stuff you need before you start knitting. So my question for you is communicate. Have you communicated with your tech editor and asked them, hey, what's your reasoning behind this? Tech editors don't mark things for fun. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> So maybe there's some something that your tech editor sees that's an issue that would with something specific to your pattern, something specific to the formatting of your pattern or your instructions that they think, hey, it would be better here. Um, and I, I'm not going to assume that I know what their intentions are. Um, I will say that as a knitter. I really like for all of the extra stuff, like the materials list and the romance and the special techniques and the abbreviations and all that to be in a separate place from the instructions so that the instructions I can <clears throat> paper print. Uh, so I can print up the instructions or just refer to the instructions in one part and all the other stuff can be separate. What did she say? The reason she suggests is that the knitter may choose not to print, see, not to print the techniques if they already know them, plus the pattern will also come in an ebook format. Ha ha. So that was what you said, Christina, when we were reviewing this question. If it's a book format, then you may want everything to be in one place so that the knitter can print just the instructions that they need and refer to the special things in another glossary or another part of the pattern. Um, I think that's reasonable. I don't know what your formatting is set up to be. So I would say either put it all in the front, like a 
pre like a intro material where yeah, it's like all in one place techniques they already know them so yeah so but they didn't they still wouldn't i mean so i think so maybe the tech editor's thinking they're gonna want to print the gauge and the needles and the information and the yarn info and the pattern so having those special techniques in the middle between those details and the instructions maybe would be inconvenient for the knitter i mean i can see that so this is an issue of formatting. The patterns will also be available individually yeah so this is an issue of formatting. Liz, you're going to have to decide what you want. Mm -hmm. The tech ed all of us tech editors will give you all kinds of great information. We may give you suggestions and all this, but ultimately it's your pattern, your decision, your final say. Um, we're just here to help. And we may have some ideas that we think might work, but ultimately it's your decision and your ideas. So sometimes what the tech editor says can kind of get our brain working on a way to improve it. Um, but we may ultimately go with another, another direction, which is totally fine because it's your design and your pattern. Creative Media DK says in the beginning, mention the technique and put the pages in yeah the at the end yeah at the back and wasn't that in her question too yes exactly i think that was part of her question that she could do that like see you know like you could list the special techniques the same way that you would list the needles or list the yarn or list mm -hmm. the notions you could list the special techniques and say see page x for instructions mm -hmm. to these techniques you could do and, that and that um, would be something that your tech editor may need to also check is that you refer to the correct page, the whatever mm -hmm. page it is to. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I would definitely put a page number. I wouldn't just say, obviously, you'd put a page number, um, especially in like an ebook where there uh, ebooks tend to have more going on. There's more pages. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need those, you might need those techniques for other things in the book, not just the one. I don't know. Definitely put a yeah. page number. But I guess you could do that. List it like you would list the notions. Mm -hmm. But just to refer to the details of it will be in the back. I mean, it depends on the formatting, like you said. And that's part of the non-design stuff is that you've got to figure out what looks good, what makes your pattern readable, what makes your pattern more usable. Um, if your pattern's already formatted before you send it to testing, you may also ask your testers, hey, what do you think works best? What did you find that you had to refer to over and over again that you wish was in a different place? Yeah, what so, do your knitters like? You know, mm -hmm. the people that like to knit your patterns, what do they like? How do they like it done? Testing and is I, so good for stuff like that. Definitely an aspect of testing that you can take advantage of. Uh, the other aspect of this still um, that I would also kind of push a little on is you need to have a template for your individual patterns that is kind of different from what an ebook would be. So if your template is set, then these issues are just consistent between your patterns. Um, and that can make your brand really strong is if your patterns always have the same format, you know, where you have this first and then this and then this, then your knitters come to be familiar with it and it becomes uh an attractive aspect of purchasing one of your patterns is that yeah. they already know how your patterns work because it's always in the same format um so i would ask you maybe to consider that um designing a template that works really well for all of your individual patterns ebooks will be a whole nother ball game but definitely for your um individual purchases it, I hope that helps. Consistency, <laughs> consistency across patterns is a very good idea. It's really, really a good idea if you like, you know, it's a very good idea to have consistency across patterns for all the reasons that you just said. Can you let us know, Liz, if we answered your question? If you're still here, we'd love to know if you have any further clarification on that. But basically, it really is up to you. <laughs> um, all right, where are we at with time? It's 1225. Okay, so we had a few other um, great questions come in email, via email. Um, those of you who are still here and have a question, please toss it into the comments below. Uh, we'd love to answer any questions that you might have about um, tech editing, uh, pattern design, pattern writing, knitting, whatever. Um, 
throw it into the comments and we'll do our best to answer if we, um, we, we, we may not be said, able. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, we answered her question and it was so helpful. So that is awesome. Good. Oh, I'm glad good. we were able to help you, Liz. Thanks for asking such a good question. I'm glad you, you did. Um, so uh, I had a question come by email. Is how are designers expected to handle awkward, quote unquote, awkward, increase or decrease rates? For example, say I have 70 sleeve stitches before the cuff starts and I need to make it 48 for the cuff. So in other words, it's like a balloon a puff end of the sleeve that's going down to a narrow diameter. So I need to reduce 70 by 22 in the space of a single round and it doesn't lend itself to a neat knit three, knit two together sort of thing. Is the designer expected to put together a complicated formula or just say in the next round decrease evenly by 22 stitches? I mean, I realize it's up to me and I can do either, but what is considered good practice? In the past, now this is a little background information, in the past, knitters have complained about both approaches. If the formula is complicated, they find it confusing. But if the instructions say just decrease by 22, they find it insufficiently informative. So I always struggle with how best to handle this. So any input from tech editors would be appreciated. That's a great question. That is a great what question. Do you, what do you think? I um, have my own opinions. I want to hear what you have to say, Christina. Uh, I think that just to answer her question about what, do you, what is more commonly done, generally patterns have become less uh, leaving things up to the knitter. Patterns have become much more instructed, much more specific. I very rarely see things like decrease evenly around 22 stitches. Like when I was first knitting, everything was like that. You know, it always said things like decrease evenly around seven stitches or whatever. I never see that now in patterns I tech edit. They're always specific um, most of the time. So I, I will say it totally is up to you. The only thing I would say is if you are going to write the, um, sometimes what people, what designers will do, and this is an error. If you say, if you do say decrease evenly around by 22 stitches on the next round, that's correct. And if you spell it out, knit three together this many times, then at the end, knit two, whatever, right? That's correct too. But if you write, um, you know, knit, knit three, knit two together, around. Lots of designers will do that. And they know that at the end of the round, there's going to be a couple stitches that don't work out. That's something you can't do. You can't just write knit, knit three, knit two together around if it, unless that really works. So if that multiple of five stitches doesn't really work, then you can't write that. But, um, I, I don't see decrease evenly around hardly at all anymore. I don't see that. Most patterns explain things now very specifically. That's what I have found. And I think that's what the pendulum... But they're both correct. They're both correct. They're both correct. So here's here, and I think that's the problem, is you're also dealing with customer service issues where you have complaining knitters who don't like it one way and don't like it the other way. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a struggle, I think, as a designer, because we want to please our customers. Um, the pendulum has, is swung. So like Christina mentioned, in the beginning of, um, you know, the mid-century knitting, even up until like the 90s, maybe early 2000s, knitting patterns were, could a whole sweater pattern could be like a paragraph or two. The whole sweater pattern, including si all the sizes. So there was less information. There was a lot more assumption of knowledge for the knitters to have up front. And we have swung because of digital patterns and the internet and everything else and a huge influx of new knitters into the knitting world. Um, we've swung into instructions that are more detailed. There's a what I call a lot of hand-holding in patterns now where every almost every line and line instructions are super detailed there's no assumption of knowledge or very little assumption of knowledge everybody knows what a knit is or what a purl is right but um 
generally speaking, line instructions are more detailed. So then that leads us to a problem <laughs> because on the one hand, we want to take care of our knitters and encourage and people not to be frustrated with our pattern. But on the other hand, you have to decide what your brand is doing. What are my patterns doing? Who am I? What am I, what are my values in my knitting sphere? In my little knitting world of what I'm providing to my customers, what's important to me? And let me take a little bit of soul searching because there is absolutely nothing wrong with a two paragraph sweater pattern. It's right. still correct, like what Christina said. And there's nothing wrong with a 25 page pattern that is writes out every single line for every single thing for and you know in detail so people can just follow along so you need to ask yourself is this pattern more advanced or is it for beginners number one and make sure that that's clear in the introductory or the marketing materials so that people aren't frustrated by your instructions and also decide who are you as a designer and what is the general breadth of my patterns and what do I do and what do I not do? And you might also want to think about who do I want to listen to? What is important with me and my knitters? Who, what kind of knitters do I want to attract to my patterns? Um, so I, the suggestion that I made to the person via email was it's okay to do both. So say decrease evenly by 22 stitches across the next row as follows and then give the line instruction um, so you can do a hybrid instruction where you give people the room to do it themselves and to just jump in and decrease by 22 stitches is what I would do um, or they can just follow the instructions exactly both are correct and you can include both um, so you've got a this is almost like an identity issue <laughs> I don't know Christy if you would agree with me but I think well, you I really think I think you have to lot... decide what you want to say. How far yeah, do you, you want to go? You do. Um, a lot of the a lot of the reason a lot of the times these patterns have become this way. I think because of the way we communicate now. We're on social media. We message each other. Email is so easy. There's so it's there's so many ways to communicate with designers and people working on patterns. And so to avoid confusion or questions. I think is another reason why directions and instructions have become more explicit. Myself personally, if I were writing patterns, I'd go out of my mind with all the explicitness, like it's so much to write. Um, but then when I, I, when I do sit down to think about, like that's why it's so important to be intentional, you know what I mean? When you do sit down to write a pattern, for example, um, inches and centimeters. Well, I live in America and we use the, you know, in inches. And so I would write the pattern with inches. But when I think about who might be knitting my pattern or who I want to be able to knit my pattern, what I want it to be available for, I have to include centimeters because I don't want it to only have the breadth of America. Right. And so it's the same thing for anything. If you are writing an advanced pattern and you don't expect beginners to work it and you don't think it would be good for them, then maybe you don't need to be so explicit. But if you are hoping anybody can work your pattern, you know, you might need to, you know, just think about what, what, who your pattern is serving, what you want it to serve, and also how you want to say it, you know? So there's really a lot of ways you can do it depending on what your intentions are for your brand and for your pattern and what you're trying to accomplish, right? What your goals are. And what the end result of this fabric is. So there may be instances where you need to specify how to decrease in order for them to get the same result as the sample. In other words, for them to just decrease evenly 22 stitches may not cut it for the result that you need to get in the fabric. They may actually have to decrease in a certain way in order to get the same result in all the sizes. So there's that aspect too. Um, you may need to be specific in order to make the instructions more accurate. Um, Creative Me DK says knit two, knit three, double decrease times so many times and with knit two, would that work? Absolutely. So here's the other aspect of this is 
you can, when you're trying to decrease a ton of stitches, there's all kinds of formulas that you can use to make it even. But you can also just load in your line some stitches at the beginning that are worked plain, some stitches at the end that are worked plain, and then that multiple in between that's going to work the best. Um, but it does make it more difficult if you got 10 or 11 sizes and how to write that line. Um, I have some clients who actually write out every size. Each size has its own decrease instructions or increase instructions. And that can work too um, if, you have, uh, if you have space in your pattern, you're not doing a printed yeah, pattern. Yeah, sometimes it has to be broken up by size. I do want to say one thing about Creative Me DK's comment. In the line she wrote, it's knit two, knit three together, decrease X times, mm -hmm. end with knit two, which I'm assuming that would be the only, there only would be two stitches left is how she means it. Right. Sometimes designers will write, you know, knit two, knit three, knit two on the last time and with, with a different number knit. Like, right. I don't like that. That's a different, that's a different mm -hmm. instruction. I don't yeah. like that. So I it could be, it, it could be misunderstood. It could be misunderstood. If you're writing complete instructions like that, you can't say, but on the last one, knit five, mm -hmm. you know, because no, <laughs> that's just my opinion. <laughs> right. Because it can be misunderstood and it cannot be clear. But if there's only two stitches left, you can end with knit two. Yeah. We got a comment. I appreciate teaching patterns, designs with elements that are new to me and have explicit instructions. Yeah. See, so it's helpful for everybody to have, like she's teaching the, um, the designs, you know? And so I would say, and that's great. Um, but as a designer, you have to decide, okay, is this what I want to provide to my customers? Are my patterns going to be teaching patterns there are designers that that is their modus operandi they are fantastic at providing a teaching platform within their pattern so i'm thinking of like patty lyons who does knit alongs that are all teaching um you know that kind of thing where you there are designers that that is what they do and then there are other designers that that's just not that's not no. their thing um, and my opinion is that's great. I think mm -hmm. your pattern should reflect you and your brand and what your design intention is, um, not just in the design itself, but also in how it's formatted and written. Um, and this is a great way to work together with your tech editor too, is just to say, hey, this is what I want to accomplish and this is my goals, this is what I intend. Um, so that your tech editor can help you line that up with it and can also give you some feedback when you might have strayed a little bit away from your, your goals as a designer. Well, and that's why so much of what we're doing, I mean, yes, we're checking for things that are actual mistakes that have to be corrected, mm -hmm. but also so much of what we're doing as editors is suggesting things. Like, yes. just because the way I'm reading it, for clarity, this needs to change, or for it to be, you know, more clear or more consistent, it needs to be this way. You might be like, yeah, no, no, you know, no, I don't, I don't agree. It's not what I want. I don't need that to be so clear. Or like I might say with the decrease 22 evenly around, I might say, you know, do you want to write out how that's going to be done? You know, because maybe somewhere else in the pattern, it is written out how it's done, something similar. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's why so much of what we're doing is suggesting like it really yes. is up to you because this is, this is you, right? These patterns right. are your babies and the best way they're going to, the, the way they're going to be the best is for your voice and the way you want to do it to be done as well as it can be in that pattern. Right. Yeah. So exactly. I would always ask your tech editor, you know, if it's something you would disagree with, have a little chat about it. You know, geez, I wouldn't have done it that way. Why do you think it's a good idea to do it that way? You know? Yeah, we call that steading. It's a stet. When you, when you override your editor's suggestion, you're like, nope, I just, I got to do it my way. And it's totally okay as long as what is actually incorrect is corrected. Right. So the suggestions from your tech editor can totally be ignored <laughs> if it goes beyond what you want to do for your pattern. So 
Um, we get another, another comment. comment. <laughs> For inclusiveness, why do you, do you think modular patterns haven't reemerged as the way to write a pattern? Can you define mm. what a modular pattern is? Because I'm not sure. I have in my mind uh, a different, uh, all kinds of ideas of what a what modular you're pattern. What I'm wearing is not modular. <laughs> it was a one piece. <laughs> Just seamed at the shoulder. Um, maybe uh, wrong dashes. <laughs> so tell me uh, what, uh, what, Give me an example of what a modular pattern for what you think a modular pattern is. Um, like where there's different parts that you can choose to put together. Um, well, the way I think of it is what you're wearing. When there's, you change the numbers based on like a formula and it all mm -hmm. comes together and it's all relative. You know what I mean? Like a lot of Elizabeth Zimmerman patterns. Oh, oh gosh, that's funny. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, when I think of a modular pattern, I think like you can choose uh, different body shapes and different sleeve shapes and oh. or different like it, alternative constructions. So um, Pacific Northwest Gale and Company, you got to define modular <laughs> for us. I know you're probably typing furiously as we speak. <laughs> I know. Uh, all right, we have more questions. Our world is not enough. Uh, it's not, even though we're on Insta. <laughs> um, oh, here she is. There's a chart with sizes listed across the top and the respective numbers listed below. Oh, so like Ann Budd patterns. Like she, Ann Budd has a series of books that are just like this. Uh, so she did the handy book of knitting patterns and Top down, down sweaters. Was, oh, top down sweaters is one of my favorites. Um, I th so that's a really good question. I think everything comes and goes. Now, it, for inclusiveness, why do you think modular patterns haven't reemerged as a way to write a pattern? I think they are. Yeah. Um, so uh, Swanky Emu Knits has a uh, for. Uh, a, Basically, where her patterns, you plug in your measurements, and it generates the patterns for you. Um, she's even running workshops for designers to uh, help them to apply that to their own designs. Um, I think there is, I think we are kind of moving in this direction. For some, designers are. Um, it takes a little bit more technical savvy and understanding where things can go wrong. Um, custom fit. Mm -hmm. is modular in that sense if that's what you define as modular where you where you plug in your size um but Do you mean just having the numbers and tables um, yeah because that's which, certainly um that's just a different style of writing i think exactly you know some designers like to write with tables and some don't you know yeah i mean i think that for this is um, I recently edited a pattern like this. When you have so many sizes, it can be really nice to be able to just have the numbers all on a table over here and your instructions stay nice and clean and you just put your number in. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're not looking at all these sea of numbers all the time. I have a bunch of vintage patterns from the 40s through 60s that have children through large men. Yeah, and yeah. I, I have a bunch of those too. And the great part about those is it's, I mean, my mom also knit them from like a sweater wheel, like where you, you spin the dial and you choose your thing. Generally, those, those um, work fantastic for shapes that don't, cause sweater shapes that don't have a lot of shaping. Right. So they're drop sleeve or they're raglan and they're straight body. Um, when, you, when you're talking about shaping in general, it can get a little tricky um, mm. because uh, as far as a, a woman's shape, sometimes can you're dealing with um, something that's not straight up and down um, for some, some women. So it, I don't, we also know a lot more about bodies now. And yes. I think that some of the ways those were done really weren't mm -hmm. very accurate or gave good fit. You know, we're learning a lot more about bodies. We're learning a lot more about the relationships between the points on the body and how 
they grow or don't grow in proportion to the bust, which is like the main measurement. And so, you know, sometimes to get good fitting sweaters, it can't just be the exact same thing done in every size for every single size from baby to adult. You can't do just the exact same thing and get a perfectly fitting sweater. Um, I think and sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not possible. Like, and like you said, if you have any kind of shape, that's not just a basic, you know, it, and those, a lot of the vintage designs have more ease. So you have some wiggle room there as far as fit. Um, as far as for men's and children's designs, there's definitely a lot more ease in some of those designs. I don't know if I have a good answer for you, um, Gail. It's good to talk about, though. Uh, Twiggy in the 60s might have put a period on that. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not so sure. Uh it's it's definitely something to discuss. And I do think that there's swings in design and in what is popular and what works and what doesn't work. Um, we, we see there's a cycle. A lot of times what was popular comes back in and then it swings back out again. So, um, oh, <laughs> Liz wants to see our hand knits, <laughs> Christina. <laughs> It's not hand knit. It's not hand knit. <laughs> Sarah's wearing all the beautiful hand knits. Mine are in my closet. This is from a store. <laughs> You've been found out. <laughs> oh my god! From a store, I'm like blushing. <laughs> I can show you my. I Come can on, show let's you. See, let's all see. right. All right. And I haven't, and it's so funny because I haven't taken any pictures of it yet. It's so embarrassing. You guys are the first ones to see. I have socks. I have socks on the needles. No, we want to see your coat. Come on. Socks. Put those down. All right. All right. I'm going to back way up. This is kind of embarrassing. All right. It's a sweater. And it has a hood. Isn't it awesome? I love that thing. And the hood button's on. So I took a, uh, I actually used, I cheat. I used a ready to wear hood from my favorite jacket and I just traced the shape <laughs> and then knit it. <laughs> uh, thanks, Liz. I need to that take pictures fun. and I had promised one of a Kate that I would do a a slow-mo and I haven't done it. I'm slow. I'm more than slow on the slow-mo. <laughs> okay. So I think we still have some questions. How much time do we have? We have 10 minutes. We can do one minutes. more. Okay. One more. Okay. We're going to address something really hard. Are you ready? Okay. So Christina did a whole blog post to answer this question. <laughs> Um, so thanks, Liz. She says she's so clever to add a hood to this Elizabeth Zimmerman pattern. Yes. So this is the adult surprise jacket by Elizabeth Zimmerman and it took forever to knit. It's a very, <laughs> it's a huge gob of knitting and it weighs about four pounds, but it's very warm. So, uh, Christina this week published a, what might be considered contentious. Perhaps. Um, Perhaps uh, proportion, about proportional ease in knitting patterns. So this is going to be an ongoing discussion. We're just going to kind of touch it a little bit today. Um, I would suggest that you guys go to Christina's blog it's at the, post. It's at the link in my bio on Instagram if you want to read it. Um, obviously, we can't go into as much detail right now, but um, no, it's we there. can't. It's there. Um, I'm just going to like preface this by saying that a, a lot of this is our own personal opinion of what we see works and doesn't work in pattern as far as sizing. So just a little bit of a definition is that there's an ongoing discussion on Instagram and in other places about the use of proportional ease in sizing versus using the same ease across sizes. And what that means is when you knit a sample size, um, compared 
the sample garment to the body size that you knit it for. So let's say for instance, you knit a garment to fit body size 40 inch chest. And that sample garment, that sweater, has a certain amount of ease at the different points on the body. So let's say it has two inches of positive ease at the bust and an inch of positive ease at the underarm depth and an in like uh, a couple inches at the neck. In other words, that sample compared to the body size that it's knit for has a certain amount of ease. And there is a way of grading where you add the same amount of ease all the way up the size chart and all the way down the size chart so that all of the sizes have the same or about the same ease applied to the to their body shape and size um, so that when they knit the sweater they get the same amount of ease as what is pictured in the sample now the other way of grading that as being discussed is to add a proportional amount of ease and the proportional amount of ease is where you would use a percentage. So let's say that two inches of ease at the bust is a certain percentage of the total bust circumference in that body size. Then you would add that percentage of ease to the different parts all the way up and all the way down as kind of a form of a ratio. Um, so. Christina wrote a long blog post on it. We've had a lot of discussions on this in the last week, and I think we probably need to devote a whole Q&A to it um, and more information on it because we're going to run out of time here. Um, but just as a general idea of what we personally agree, and Josephine says she, she agrees, agrees with us. Josephine, to, is, which, Josephine is a tech editor. She's not just a tech editor. No, she, she isn't. She's a very accomplished grading um, uh, she grades patterns for a living too. Right. Um, so the, uh, my perspective on this, you can go read Christina's opinion. I haven't written a blog post on this, but my perspective is you have to make the pattern in whatever way you get there. You have to make it so that when the knitter knits it and puts it on their own body, it has the same fit as what they see in the sample on the sample model. If you can't achieve that same fit, then your pattern is not producing what you promised to the knitter. So there are some examples where I use proportional ease when I'm grading, but only on certain parts that I don't have good body information on. So I might in start my numbers with, for the neckline, like if the neckline opening is 140% of the neck body circumference, I might start there to get an idea of where I'm at related to the body size, but I wouldn't stay there. I would try to get as close to the body measurements plus the design ease as I can get so that the fit is the same across all sizes. Some people believe that proportional sizing um, should have more ease for a larger body. And we disagree with that for a couple of reasons. Christina, can you take it from there? Why I, would you disagree? I think that because it's not going to fit the same. I understand that in other things in the world, objects and other things, if you make them bigger, you're going to have, and, and more spaces around them, it makes sense and they will look correct. But on a body, you have to think, if this is your body and you have that much ease outside it, making the body bigger is not going to mean that more ease will make it look the same. It will make it look different. Just think about how a sweater fits that is very fitted. That's how it's supposed to look. And that's how it looks in the picture that they see. It's very fitted. You can see your curves. You can see it goes up to here. You can't fit clothes underneath it. Okay. If you add extra ease in larger sizes or less ease in smaller sizes, it's not going to look like that. So like a bralette pattern, gonna, let's right, say, it's or something not like that. Look a like zero that. ease garment. It will look different. And, um, you know, um, 
you said something that made me want to say something and now I went on this big whole thing and I forgot. <laughs> we could talk about this for about an hour and a half. So we won't, <laughs> we don't right. have to go far with it. Um, but you know, it's not, a, it's, um, oh God, I'm so mad. I had something I was going to say and I <laughs> forgot. Oh, that makes me so mad. It's on tip of my tongue. Man. Oh, we'll come back to it. I, you know what? We'll be back here in a month and we can talk. We're going to pick up where we left off because we have to go in a minute anyways. Um, oh, just think maybe just to leave you with this, to think about yes, it. If, you know, think about it's, it, you're not just working with like a, a pencil, right? You're working with a body that has many different points and many things happening at the same time. And if mm -hmm. you add extra ease across the sizes and make, Bigger sizes have more ease and smaller sizes have less ease. From the sample that you made, that you know how it fits and that's your picture and that's what it's supposed to fit like, that's what it's supposed to look like. If you change that here, then it's going to change it here. Yes. It's going to make your it whole changes sleeve. changes the underarm. It's going to mm -hmm. make your whole sleeve be down here, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to make your neck be wider, okay? And if you're adding extra ease in the arm, because that's what you think you should be doing for larger sizes, then your cuff's going to be bigger. Right. Everything is related in a body. Everything is connected. So everything that you, it's all related. And anytime you add more ease than the design intends, it's mm -hmm. going to change now the next part of the sweater. Right. And it's not going to look the same. It's it won't. not going to look the same. And it's not. And then, and then you're defaulting on your promise to the knitter. All right, so we're getting, we got to wrap it up here. Uh, date and, for next month. So it'll uh, be the third, my cal cal third calendar. Monday. The third Monday of the month. So that would be the and Gail 21st, says, December 21st. 21st. December 21st. Oh, right before Christmas. So interesting how this relates to garment construction as a sew as knitting stretches. So it's a lot like the difference between sewing with knit fabrics and wovens. Yeah, mm. it is. And we're just going to start this discussion today because we don't have time to get into it. I have so much to say on this, and I know Christina does too, so much that she wrote a dissertation on her blog, which I highly <laughs> recommend so that you go I read. I tried so hard to make it. No, you but know, I tried you so got Shorter, but there's a lot happening. A lot happening. Right. Hey, my pet, my phone's about ready to die, so we got to jam so that I can upload this video. We'll see you guys on the 21st of December. I hope you guys are all safe, happy, healthy. Mm -hmm. take, please take care of yourselves. Send us questions, and we'll talk to you next month. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye.